Hi guys, this is the Texas Flycaster YouTube channel. My name is Shannon and you are the Texas Flycasters. Today I'm doing a good old fashioned bait and switch. And the chum today was video, but the, the switch is to audio. So this is a really spectacular audio interview with Captain Scott and all. It's not really an interview, it's a lecture he did for CCA, Coastal Conservation Association, down in the, down in the links in the description the Dallas chapter. So I'll put the slash Dallas chapter website uh, linkage there. And it was at sawgrassrods.com. Now this is really special. Sawgrass Rods, brand new company, Dallas, Texas, building rods there. And for the fly fishers out there, this is your chance to get a very, very economical, very high quality, I've got three on the way, one piece, eight, nine, fly rods so man the fly rods are just spectacular you've got to get your hands on these if you're around in the area I'll drive to you and you can try these fly rods out I'll have at least three of them on hand sawgrassrods.com so this lecture by Captain Scott Knoll out of Port O'Connor who is a guide there he's a retired homicide detective out of Houston so he's got a lot of stories like he says in this interview in this uh, lecture if you're not catching fish you're getting a lot of homicide stories which would be <laughs> a real kicker don't you think the great thing about this listen to it all the way through I promise you you will learn something about the migration patterns the timings of the year for tarpon on the Texas Gulf Coast because we know tarpon Texas Texas Gulf Coast the ultimate prize for a fly fisherman and it's a highly sought after fish for conventional guys too so sit back listen to the audio on this I've got some images that will be going through as a slideshow those are pieces of artwork that are at www.texasflycaster.com in my store for sale just don't worry about all that just listen listen closely run it back and listen again Captain Scott and all this was November the 15th, 2023, at Sawgrass Rods in Dallas, Texas, hosted by Sawgrass and attended by CCA Dallas. Guys, you got to hear this. I'm telling you, it's worth listening to. And we're very fortunate tonight to have Captain Scott Knoll. Um, he has been a fly fishing guide for over 20 years. He's also a hunting guide. Um, and he fishes all around Texas, redfish, uh, tarpon, and, you know, probably well outside of Texas. Whatever. He does it for fun, <laughs> right? And so he just wanted to say a few words, and then if you'd gather your questions, you know, he'll do his best to answer them. Um, <laughs> yeah, what's that? I want to thank everyone, everyone that's at this meeting tonight. This is the finest turnout we have had for 25 years at a CCA meeting in Dallas. And I'm very grateful for everyone that's here to uh, participate in this, uh, in this meeting. So thank you, Kyle. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> well, I didn't do any little uh, projection deals or anything like that. I don't do that. I just get up and start talking. My wife always asks, well, what are you going to talk about? I, said, I don't know. I'm just going to get started. Uh, like I said, I've been guiding over 20 years now. I left the police department in 2005, and I was guiding before that. Uh, Houston police officer, worked in homicide. So if you're on my boat and we're going to fish for the day and it gets slow, I'll just start telling you murder stories. <laughs> people, people kind of tend to like it, so I don't know. Uh, it, I started off guiding Galveston. And I've always fished Port O'Connor, been been fishing there since the early 80s. And I had bought some property down there and got a little ranch and moved down there five, six years ago and started guiding exclusively down in Port O'Connor now. Uh, I do guiding on a Poland skiff, which is, it's one of the Sabine Poland skiffs. Uh, Brian Little's making a fantastic little boat. Uh, it's all aluminum Poland skiff quiet as can be and I run it in it'll float in four inches of water give or take so I do a whole lot of polling for redfish in the backwaters I get the question all the time guy just a minute ago so you only take fly fishermen not nah, conventional fly 
we'll go crabbing if you want to. We'll do whatever you want to do. But, uh, yeah, you can go out there and conventional fish with me, but it's all sight casting. Uh, we're just out there pulling along in the back marshes looking for redfish. Uh, this time of year is really good. Uh, I get that question all the time of what what's the best time of year. Every bit of the year except for March and April. March and April, I pretty much just don't even book trips. Uh, the wind gets to such a point during those times that I end up canceling about half of my trips. So I typically just take those two months off and concentrate the rest of the year. May, <clears throat> it picks back up. Winds get better. So May, June, I'm mostly on reds. Then the tarpon start showing up on the beachfront. I've got a 26-foot catamaran uh, made by Freedom Boats. And I'd start running the beachfront, chasing tarpon. They'll typically show up the last week of May, first week of June. They don't get real consistent until middle to late June. We can do that on fly. We can do it on conventional. We can troll for them, however you want to, whatever you want to fish for them with. Uh, throw a lot of DOA uh, bait busters at them. Uh, me and Collins were talking about some rods today to, to make that work a little bit better. I think he's got it wired. You're going to fix me up with that. Uh, do that all through the summer. I'll still end up doing, yeah, I'll still end up doing, uh, he's trying to sell me one. <laughs> but, uh, stand at my house tonight. I know. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're just going to tuck it into my bed with me? <laughs> That's a DOA bait buster for anybody who's not familiar with it. It's a killer tarpon bait. Uh, works it really well, works really well on them. Can't get it set back in there. Scott, before anything, there it goes. Uh, decide to uh, take a uh, tarpon trail. Look at the premium time for tarpon in the summer. In the summer, like I said, they, they'll get there late May, early June. Then July, they start getting a little more, uh, more consistent, I guess you'd say. If you catch it at the very beginning when they first get there, which we never know when that's going to be. You can't book a trip six months out and say, I want to go May 15th, and that's when they're going to show up. It doesn't work that way. Some years they don't show up until late June. But if you happen to hit it right on the first days that they're there, it's like a migration. They come up out of Mexico. And they migrate up the coast, and I get calls from all my buddies further south, and they say, they're coming, they're coming. And then sometimes they'll stall out at Port Aransas. And then it's two or three weeks before they get to me. I happened to be there one day when the the beginning of the tarpon run started and I hit the front end of the migration. I was by myself, of course, no customer. And throwing flies, I had 20 to 25 eats that day, which if anybody who's ever been tarpon fishing, just getting an eat is a big deal. On the fly, by myself, 20, 25 eats, I put nine in the air and I landed three all by myself. That's world class anywhere you go. I mean, you can go to the Keys, you go wherever you want to. That's world class. The next day, there was one school. So that time of year is so tough because they come through in waves. If you hit the wave, it's stellar. It's an unbelievable. If you hit in between the waves, we're going to be talking about murders. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much the way it's going to be. I know a whole lot of history about Matagorda Island. We can talk about that, the lighthouse. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, you become an entertainer as a guide. You have to. That we're in the entertainment business, and you got to know stories. You got to know some stuff, and uh, that'll continue on. Like I said, starting July, they'll get a little more consistent, and I pretty much just abandon the redfish stuff during that time. July, August, late June, it gets so damn hot up in the shallow water. My redfish will go to sleep. I say they go to sleep. <clears throat> they quit moving and you can literally poke them with a rod in the backwaters where I go. I go in places where it's six or eight inches and it's mud bottoms. It gets real hot back there. Zero oxygen. First thing in the morning, we can catch some fish. If you don't catch your fish by 8.30, 9 o'clock, we're pretty much done. We're going to go, we're going to see fish where you're going to be able to poke at them and you can throw whatever you want to in front of them and they're going to turn and they're going to look the other way. The more you bug them, the more they turn, they, they're not going to eat. Every now and then you can get one to eat a fly, little bitty small fly, and just drop it right in front of them. 
kind of tickle their nose with it. I say you're getting them when they're yawning, you know, but they really do. They just pretty much go to sleep. So I, I pretty much abandon the redfish thing that time of year and just concentrate on the tarpon when the weather lets you. Uh, that's the biggest part about the tarpon fishing is we have to have the right winds, got to have the water, you know, if the wind gets above 13, 14 miles an hour, it's too rough out there. Uh, it's not too rough for my boat, but you start getting white caps at 12 miles an hour, just a little bitty white caps, and that's what I'm looking for for a tarpon. I can see a tarpon on a flat day, a quarter, half a mile away when they're up rolling. When they get the wind, it starts kicking the tops of the waves off. Now you got ADD. You're looking every which way, and you it, you don't know which one's a tarp and which one's a wave. You can still go fish it, but it just makes things incredibly harder. I'll concentrate on the jetties on those days, and we've got a lot of tarp in the jetties now. Uh, a lot of people don't even pay attention to them, don't know that they're there. I've got tarp in this big on up to 200 pounds. So, the jetty tarpon, that's all summer. Well, I had three buddies, three guides that took a day off during Christmas break last year, yeah. and they caught three tarpon at the jetties at Christmas. But they're all juveniles. They're all, they were two to three footers. Uh, juvenile tarpon, I don't know, who, who knows much about tarpon in here, but I've been studying them a lot. Uh, they're juveniles up until the time they're about, eight eight and a half years old nine years old they're still juveniles so wherever they're born is where they stay and they're at that point they're about four to four and a half feet long but they wear like these little tarpon that i'm catching off the jetties right now on up to three foot they were born there they were and where are they going in winter it's up for debate i found them in bayous i found them in up under do boat docks and canals I, been doing some research let's call it but those little fish those are our resident fish when they get four and a half feet long then they join join in and those big fish go back and forth to mexico uh, they continue on past us but the, i say it's like a bus you know, like a bus dropping kids off there's some that are going to stay down in port port aransas there's some that are going to stay at port o'connor everywhere that there's an opening brazos river on up Galveston, Sabine, there's tarpon that stay at each one all the way down. Then in the fall, come September, October, depends on what the fronts do. We start getting those good fronts. That'll start moving them south. This year it was mid to late October before the Galveston fish even started moving. Then they'll start moving back down and they'll slowly go down. And as long as it's not a real bad, bad cold front, they'll stop at each location all the way down. So I love September, October, because I got all the, the Louisiana fish, Sabine fish, Galveston fish. They'll move down to Port O'Connor and they'll just stay, sometimes for a week, sometimes two, three weeks, and they'll be everywhere. So you're asking when the best time is? Consistently, July and August, I can consistently find some schools throughout the day, uh, daylight till dark. September, we start getting some of those migratory fish so the schools get bigger but the fish move more they're they're up and down the coast they're maybe here today two miles down that way the next day six miles back up north the next day they do a lot of zigzagging that time of year but if you hit them you usually have bigger schools so it's it's all a crap shoot i think i think july august i have a better consistent day in day out chance of finding some fish it may be only one or two schools it's all you need some days some days you need to run into six or seven schools to get one eat but just seeing some tarpon is usually pretty cool and so when you're you what uh it's a variety of bait fish but mostly menhaden uh if you start finding the bait fish typically you'll find them now the the jetty tarpon those little juveniles they will piss you off. They're eating stuff that's about a quarter to an eighth inch long. And they're in big, big wads. And if you look down in the water, it looks like somebody threw a bunch of glitter in the water. And it's just settling. It's all bait fish. But they're tiny. And they'll push them all together and they'll ball them up into a bait ball. And then they go through them with their mouths open. It's like whales eating krill. You can't... 
I don't care what you do, you can't imitate a bait ball with a lure. It just doesn't work. The only luck I've had is throwing clear with some sparkle in it. You know, a big clear soft plastic that's got some glitter. Throw that out there. I get my my theory. I try to think like a fish, but I don't know. Until I can talk to one, I'm, I'm not sure if I got it right. But I make it out that that looks like a little piece of the bait ball broke off. You know, it's a little glittery something, you know, about that big that's glittering, moving off. Maybe they think it's a some of the bait got away from the school and they just go eat it. But that's really the only luck I've had with it. And I have thrown everything at them. I've talked, me and Mark Nichols spend hours on the phone, the owner of DOA, the inventor of all the DOA baits. He and I are good friends. We've spent hours on the phone talking about these tarpon. And he's, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Have you tried this? And, yep, I've tried everything. Everything that you can think of. I even threw chatter baits at them this year just because I found one in my garage. So but, uh, when they're migrating, are you out there kind of like parked in there with a bunch of other guides or is it just you? Uh, there's you know I mean? there's right. several guides in Galveston or in, uh, in Port O'Connor that do the same thing that I'm doing. Uh, but it's kind of it's so there. spread out. OK, yeah. You know, all of us have a couple of buddies. Right. And we're on the phone with them. We spread out. Whoever finds the fish calls the other ones. If they don't call you and you find out they caught fish, they're in trouble. Yep, right, right. But then we kind of, we all know how to work the tarpon without spooking them. And we can work together real well, so we'll call each other in. And that helps. Uh, one of my really good ones, he retired last year, so that was one less. Then the other one was hunting in Alaska for like three weeks, and so I was on my own. Nice. It yeah. was hard. Yeah. It was a whole lot harder to find them on your own. You know, I burned a lot of gas. That's right, uh, yeah. You spend a whole lot. Of, when you come tarpon fishing, there's days when you may not even cast. I'll be straight up honest with you. Before you, before you book a trip, you just got to know tarpon fishing is different. But once you hook one, it's in your blood, and you, you'll want to do it all the time. Question for you: What's the best piece of advice you could give somebody in terms of preparation before they get on your boat or any other guy you work with? Very good question. Not tying. Captain, bait placement. Talk a little bit. For, uh, for fishing the way that I do, practice hitting your target. You're hitting your target is way more important than distance. Uh, like on the fly side, I'll get guys all the time and say, and I know you're a fantastic fly caster. I've had you on the boat. Uh, but I have guys all the time that tell me, oh, man, I've been practicing my cast, and I can cast 90 feet. Can you hit this? Well, no, but I can throw it 90 feet. It doesn't do me any good. I can't see a fish at 90 feet anyway. I can see fish at 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet, depending on the weather, and I need you to be able to hit this. Whatever distance you can consistently hit this, whether it's with a bait caster or a fly rod. Practice. I know y'all are all up here. Y'all a bunch of green fishermen. Y'all bass fish a lot up here. You do the flipping, the little underhand flipping where you're really accurate and you're putting it into a cup. Learn to do that, and you'll catch way more. I, my bass guys that show up and get on the front end of my polling skiff and I start pulling on the backwaters, they catch three times as many redfish as my regular saltwater guys. It's because they can put it right where it needs to be, right in front of the fish. Uh, redfish, when he's in that shallow water, he's looking down, he's feeding, he's looking right here. This is, this is his whole world is right here. If you land it over here, Seldom will they even pay attention to it. Every now and then you'll get them to do a reaction bite if they, they feel it, you know, it hits over there, they spin around. Depends on what's happening out there. If the shrimp are really active and they're jumping, they'll pay attention to it. But most of the time they're looking to kick something out of the grass or out of the mud, whatever is right there in front of them that kicks up, that's what they eat. And they really don't care anything. They're not gonna chase a bait that lands five feet away from them. So that's number one being able to do that uh, before you book your trip talk to your guide emails text whatever, whatever their preferred way is but tell them what you're expecting and what kind of fishing you want to do and i mean i got guys all the time call me up and there's hey you know we want to go we want to go catch a bunch of trout catch a bunch of trout's not what i do but i've got friends that do 
and I will turn you on to that one of those other guides. And I'm not one of the guides that just says, okay, I'll take you. And I have no idea where the trout are or what I'm going to be doing with them. But there are guides out there that will do it because they're just wanting to make a buck. But I'm I'm more about talk to your talk to your guy. He may only be a bait guy, or he may only be a cut bait guy. There's a lot of those in Aransas Pass. Uh, you call down Aransas Pass and you start going to fish, and you get all booked up with this guy, and he show up. It happened to a buddy of mine. And they get there, and he's got all his lures, and he's got bags of lures, and they get there, and this guy's cutting up mullet. And he's getting ready to go soak mullet out there on the flats. Because the guy told him he, he was flats fishing. Well, he's flats fishing. He's out on the flats. He just anchored up throwing mullet. But being able to know what your guide specializes in, I've been doing it long enough. I've, I've got enough notoriety, whatever you want to call it. I wrote for magazines. I've got the the podcast everybody listens to that it books me and they know what i do and how i do it so i don't usually have that problem too much uh that and i got guys have been fishing with me for 20 years now so they know me i know them so I, but that's one of the biggest things that i hear complaints about is they go with a the guy they're expecting to throw croakers and he's got them throwing soft plastics and he doesn't do croakers uh vice versa so know what your guide does. It's best to get get a referral if you don't know who the guy is. But uh, as far as from my standpoint, being able to cast accurately is is the number one. Uh, knot tying, I don't care. I'll tie your knots. You know, that doesn't bother me. Uh, gear, I've got gear. You know, if you bring crappy gear, I'm gonna look at it and ask you if you want to use mine. <laughs> It's going to be a better day. You know, we're going to have a better experience if you go ahead and use my stuff. But Fuck I've got... Buy my shit. Buy my shit. About to, have, about to have three of your fly rods on my boat. So, yeah. But I said if it's crap, your stuff's not crap. But I have had people show up with a reel that doesn't turn. That they're going... Can't Why don't you use mine? You know? But, uh, yeah. Does it bother a guy when somebody brings their own stuff? Not really. I mean, some guys, I guess it probably does. The only ones I ever hear that really complain about that are the straight up bait guides. They want to cast for you, they want to put your rod in a rod holder or hand it to you. They're going to cast. They're going to hand it to you, and they want you to sit there and wait till something eats. Sometimes they even set the hook. They'll put them in rod holders and set the hook. That's some of the croaker guides, some of the the cut mullet guides. They're, they're, they will be a little more particular about that. Now, if we're going tarpon fishing, I'd prefer let's go ahead and use my stuff because I know my stuff works, and I know you may only get one shot at a tarpon in an entire day, and I prefer to you to be using my gear that I know the knots are tied right. I got the right line on. I got everything. Everything's lined up right. Uh, now, if you fish with me before and you know what gear to get and you've done your research on it, no problem. Bring it. You know, you, just fly fish for carpet? No. Nah, conventional, fly, trolling. We do a little bit of everything on them. On fly, no, uh, on conventional, uh, usually 50, sometimes 65 pound braid, and then I'll have 60 or 80 pound fluorocarbon for a leader, and my leader's going to be longer than the fish I expect to catch. So if we're out on the beachfront and we're looking at those 200 pounders are starting to show up, there are beyond six foot, I'm going to have six to seven, eight foot of, of leader on there. Your average size it really isn't an average. Uh, there's a whole lot of 90 to 120 pounders right in that range. There's a lot of those around Port O'Connor all summer. Uh, those fish are going to be five, five and a half feet. You know, they grow longer and they get skinny, but then 
they're like us, you know, is, is they don't, they quit growing longer, about six and a half, seven foot, and then they just start getting bigger. You know, it's really cool to see one that's, that's tall, you know, we call them tall. When we see them in the water and their top of their back to their belly is like that, and they're still not any longer than that 120 pounder that you caught last week, but man, you know, it's a big fish. It's a big, big difference. But uh, the reason you have that leader longer, I saw a few people kind of perk up when I said that long of a leader. <clears throat> With braid, you do not want the tail of that fish slapping on that braid. When we get into those real big fish, the 120 to 200 pounders, that tail slapping on that braid, we're going to fight it for a while. It's going to take a Pretty good, especially if it's your first one, it's going to take you a while to get it in. The entire time that you're fighting him, he's going away from you. That tail is slapping on that line the whole entire time, and it will fray that braid. It won't do it to the fluorocarbon. What's fluorocarbon the will be fine. What's the longest fight you've ever had, Joy, on a tarpon? That we successfully landed? Yes. <laughs> well, the longest fight was about an hour and 45 minutes, and we broke it off about 10 feet from the boat. But... Longest fight that successfully landed is probably 30, 45 minutes, something like that. Um, I had one on fly that well, that one day when I was by myself, I had one that I estimated 185 to 190, somewhere in that range. And I had it on a 12 weight. And I got it to the boat in 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Can you talk about the fight of a fish like that, how you use the butt section of the rod as opposed to the tip yeah. section of the rod? Uh, <clears throat> fighting a tarpon, it's fun to watch people when they first start off fighting the tarpon. They they do the the thing you see in a picture, way up here and it's up there. You're not doing a damn thing to that, that fish. Whether you're fighting with a, a fly rod or a conventional rod, get down low, rod parallel or lower to the water, use this part of the rod. Don't use that part and turn your body. Keep it low. If he's going that way, turn it this way. Low down. He turns, you finally turned him, he's going that way. Now turn this way. Keep it low, keep it tight, and concentrate on bending this part of the rod. I keep my rod up on my elbow like this, put the butt up against here, and keep it in tight to my body, and turn, I turn my body instead of using my arms. You start getting into the, one of these fights, a 30, 45 minute fight, you'll be worn out using your arms. And if you're just using this part of the rod, it looks cool. You got a big bent rod. Yeah, look at me. I'm, this is really cool. You're not doing anything to that fish. And the other part of it is you have to stay on that fish the entire time. If you give him a break, you got to take a break. You're worn out. I got to take a break, man. You take a break, he's taking a break. You're going you're gonna to give him just that much longer, and he's going to fight twice as hard when he's done with that break. The other part... When he comes to the top, use that rod, use that, that lower part of that rod and jerk his head back underwater. They'll try to come up, tarpon can breathe air. They gulp air. That's part of their rolling and all that. When a tarpon comes up, when we're in these big fights, tarpon comes to the top and you see it, the line starts doing this, it's coming up. As it's doing that, put the rod tip underwater, lean over the side of the boat, Yank that rod down, yank the tip down as hard as you can possibly do. I know you're tired, get the rod tip down, do that. Because if he gets up and he gets that air and I see his mouth, I usually have my gloves on because they're getting pretty close. I got my gloves on, I'm ready to do a little lip gripping. Everything's all cool, I see that. I take my gloves off, I get me a drink, and I lean back against there. That's a It's a 15 minute penalty every time that they take it's 15 minutes, guarantee every breath that they take. And it happens all the time. You, you better, the way I say it in, in tarpon vision is break their will. Break their spirit. Yeah. Break their spirit, break their will. Whether it's a tarpon, a big jack, a big bull red, fishing for amberjack is especially, you better break an amberjack yeah. real quick. The first five minutes of the fight, if you can break that fish in the first five minutes, you're going to land him pretty quick. If if he gets any inkling at all that he can get away from you, he's going to keep trying. And they will, Tarpon will fight till they're dead. And when it gets into those real long fights like that, I start getting nervous. I just soon cut the line. 
you know, for the fish, right? Just for the fish, right. for the sake of the fish. But a lot of times it's that guy's first tarpon ever because he's, you know, this is his first one he's ever hooked, and I'm not going to be the guy to cut the line. For, you know, if it's a buddy of mine and we're out fishing, and or it's me, and that for whatever reason I got a hot fish that does not want to come in, I'll cut the line. I'll break off before That's I kill it. That's a real thing. A before hot I kill fish. the fish. You know, oh, some fish you can put the brakes on; they don't listen. You know? yeah. yeah, there are hot fish, and yeah. that's the other thing. I get. What's a typical tarpon fight? Tough to tell. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I've had my butt kicked by a thirty pounder. Thirty, 30 minutes, three and, hours. Yeah, thirty minutes, three hours. Who knows? Uh, well, give you a good example. One of my buddies that I, I stay in touch with on the phone. I called him up. He was at the jetties. I found a bunch of fish outside Pascavallo. I'm on them. My customers are on them. Everything's great. We're hooked up with two fish, 100, 110, 120 pounders. They're jumping. One comes off. I call Steve and say, hey, man, you guys, you know, I saw you at the jetties. You your guys want tarpon today. And he goes, yeah. I said, come on down, Pascavallo. Get in front and inside my boat between me and the pass. Big school up there. He comes down and gets in there. My fish is doing a, we call it a rodeo. He's literally doing this, rounding around the boat, and all I'm doing is on a trolling motor, just sitting on my console, and my customer's up there in the front, and we're just going in circles. Fish never leaves more than 30, 40 yards from the boat, never gets any closer, doesn't leave, and just keeps going in a little circle all the way around the boat. Steve pulls up. I see him right outside. He's right where I told him to go. Boom, he's got a fish in the air. Fish jumps a couple of times. It goes down. Paying attention to my guy, I look back, Steve's coming right straight at me. And he is hooking it. And I'm looking in like, hey man, I'm, I've still got a fish on. Don't come, don't cut me off. He goes, can't stop, got a fish. <laughs> and his fish ran from up there straight behind my boat and went off that way. And I was damn near lost sight of him. And he just keeps on going. We finally land our fish, get it off, and looking as, like I said, 110, 120 pounds. Looking out there, and Steve's boat's finally has stopped, but it's it's a good ways out. I called him up, say, hey, man, how big was your fish? He goes, I don't know, about 90 pounds. You just never know. Tarpon he had a, he had a hot tarpon fish. Tarpon yeah. And you get a hot fish, and they will just run and run and run and run and run. Uh, I've got a theory about that. Again, I haven't been able to talk to one, so I don't know for sure. But I think fish that have been caught before give up quicker. I think they know. Yeah. Tarpon live 50 years. You know, so chances of that big, big fish that, that rolls up and comes on in, I think he's been caught more than once. Yeah. And then you get those younger fish, those seem to be the hotter ones. And I think they haven't been caught before, and they don't know what the hell's going on. They're just going to leave as fast and as furiously as they can. If you're getting abducted by aliens, what would you do? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It'd be a cool story. <laughs> Ah, bow to the king. <laughs> you will lose a fish on the very first jump. Yeah, probably 75, 80% of the time you're going to lose your fish on the very first jump. Hooking a tarpon is like trying to drill, not harder than that, like trying to set a hook in the side of your boat. The whole mouth is a rock. There's spots in the corners where the hinges are, and there's a button in the top. We call it the button. A little small, soft spot right in the roof. If you hook the button, everything's great. It, you're going to stay hooked up. The only problem is he's got the lure inside of his mouth, and now he's got your leader on his lips, and he's going to rub on it the entire time. Chances are really good he's going to break off because he rubbed through if it's fighting too long. Corners of the mouth, they're going to shake. They're going to jump. They're going to do all that stuff, and it'll work work out. What happens with bowing to the king, we've always all heard that. I heard that way before I ever even started fishing for tarpon. Bow to the king. That first jump is insane. They do things in the air that you just can't imagine that a fish can do. And they'll be six, eight, ten feet in the air doing these big flips. And I'm talking, you know, 100, 110 pound fish. Your tendency is to go, whoa, and pull back as he's jumping. Well, when you do that, your line is tight. 100 pound fish lands on top of that line, it's going to break off every single time. As soon as he hits, it's over, breaks your line. 
if you bow to the king as he's jumping, if you can make yourself mentally do this, you will. Your first time hooking a tarpon, you will not do this. But if you can mentally make yourself do it, you lean in a little bit. It's not like a true bow. It's just throwing a little bit of slack in the line so that when he lands on that line, if he lands on the line, it's not tight, it's not tight and it doesn't break immediately. The other part is as you're pulling like that and they jump, and when they're jumping, their face happens to come towards you, which it's going to go every which way, but if their face comes towards you and you're pulling, you'll just pull the hook clean out of their mouth. It'll just it'll, it'll come flying back at you as a projectile. Uh, tarp for fish long enough, you've seen pretty much everything that you can see in that. Um, if that rod's not salt, stop. stop. <laughs> <laughs> One out of ten is about for every every ten each you get, you'll catch one. You'll put three or four in the air, and you'll catch one. Now there are days when it it really kicks off, and for whatever reason we get lucky and we we land every fish that we get that jumps, every fish that bites. Uh, but typically, overall, especially newbies coming into the game, one in ten is really really good. That's that's excellent odds. Um, beyond that, well, I went a lot longer than I intended. Mm. But beyond that, once September, October hits, my fish move off. They go back to Mexico. They, they start heading south. Um, in fact, Buddy Brian down there in, in South Padre, he said the last fish are leaving him right now. Brian Barrera. Barrera. He's the, the last of the fish are, have left South Padre for the winter. Uh, I don't think he's, uh, I, he's, he had some video the other day of a bunch of empty water and he's, and he's just kind of sad about it. So he's still going to have resident fish, just like we've got resident fish, if we can just figure out where they go. Uh, but then I go back into redfish mode, which is about right. It keeps me entertained because I do the redfish in January, February. I quit March and April for the wind. Redfish again in May, June. Then I got my tarpon jacks and all that stuff july august september october kind of starts switching back and now i've got i'm back into redfish mode on back through february again uh, so redfish can be good at any time of the year uh, i like winter better than i like the summer uh, i get guys all the time i want to come fish with you but all i got is, you know i got some time off around thanksgiving or i got some time off around christmas holidays it's perfect come on down so my best days have been January and February on big schools for Reds. So, more questions? Scott, you've got one of the best podcasts around. If you haven't heard this podcast, you should seek it out and listen to it. Appreciate it. You tell us a little bit about that and maybe prep for it. How we prep for it? A couple of beers? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we get looped and then we go. <laughs> yeah. Well, back in, I don't know, 2016, 2017, somewhere around there, my youngest daughter wanted to be in radio, so she went to college for it, and now she designs houses. But she, uh, she, was, she was doing the radio thing, and she did got an internship, and they hooked her up with John Lopez and Nick Wright on Houston Sports Radio 610. Yeah. She was their morning intern. <clears throat> I got to know John through that. He loves to fish. We stayed in touch over years, you know, for a while there. And then he called me up, or he came by the house one day. I was giving him some, donating some stuff for one of their charities. And he said, hey man, the radio station, they're getting into podcasts and they want all of us host to have a podcast i want to do one on fishing they say we can do on whatever we want i want to do one on fishing he said but i don't want to have to get a guest every week that'll be a pain in the butt and i got to do it weekly would you be interested in co-hosting i said well first off what's a podcast let's <laughs> let's get that right out there in the front i i had no idea what a podcast was he explained it to me i've had tv shows i've had all kinds of stuff pitched at me over the years nothing ever comes through I've been on some TV shows, but no, 
no series ever comes through, none of that stuff. Well, John, we talked on Saturday. Sunday evening, he calls me up. I'm thinking, eh, this ain't going to happen. He says, hey, I got uh, us a producer. I got a guy selling advertising, and I've got us a studio for two hours once a week. When do you want to start? So, I don't know. He said, how about Tuesday? I said, all right. He told me all I have to do is come in and talk fishing for 45 minutes to an hour, and he would do the rest. So that works for me. So it's called Bite Me, for those who don't know. Uh, those what don't know, get yeah. to know, because it's outstanding. If you, uh, Scott, if you give me interruption, uh, you all, everybody in this room probably listens to the tickets. Right? So yeah. they're deep in the tickets. Uh, these guys, when they get on their, on their podcast, it's four guys, there's four of them. Scott, John Bill Benson, the who's talking about now, Dean Thomas, and Caleb McCumber. Four of them get together, and it's it just, they're, they're, it's like four guys, four buddies getting together to talk fish. And it is the most incredible uh, uh, podcast that you could ever imagine. It's just incredible. It's great. Well, appreciate it. Uh, when we started it, I thought, I don't know who's going to listen to this, and this probably ain't going to last all that long. You know, they're, I'm going to run out of stuff to talk about in about three or four months, and all 12 listeners are going to go away. We're at 10,000 downloads a week now. I, we're number six in the country on fishing podcasts. Uh, the one who's right ahead of us is Iconelli. So... I don't know how the hell that happened. I have really no idea. But we just get in there and we just talk fishing. Just like I've talked to several of y'all. We just sit, sit around in the corner. We may drink a beer or two. We may have a little whiskey. And then we start talking fishing. And uh, we had a really good time with it. We all, all get along. Started with just me and John. And I brought Caleb in. He's a buddy of mine. And I brought Dean in. Dean Thomas, Slow Ride Guide Service out of Rans' Pass. I brought Dean in because there was several times where I was – gone hunting or whatever and I couldn't make it so I it kind of brought him in as a as a sub for me and everybody liked him so much that we just made him a regular and so now it's just all four of us we got a those that do Facebook we got a Facebook page I think it's like 9600 members now or something like that it's crazy amazing wow. I had I had no idea that it would take off and it still kind of amazes me Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed that audio, Captain Scott and all. You can, I'll put his linkage down there. You know, he's also famous for the Bite Me podcast. That podcast is ranked number seven among fishing podcasts in the whole nation. That's really a good place to go to the source is Captain Scott and all at Bite Me Podcast. I'll put a link to Bite Me. I'll put a link to him down there. Guys, I'm about sharing the love. If you got something to tell me, Feel free. I didn't. I had to attend this event to get this out. But if you want a one-on-one -on -one interview, if you got something going on with fly fishing and you want it to get out and get publicized, here I am. Thanks for watching. Have a great November. What's left of it? Thanksgiving is coming up. I'm working on uh, videos in the background, especially one on the double haul. Man, that is interesting. It's very difficult to film, and it is very complex. For those of you who cast a fly rod, you know what I'm talking about. Thanks for watching, guys. Like and subscribe. www.texasflycaster.com for the written word. Thanks. See you in a little while.